Well, Joseph Ledoux, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, it's such an honor to have you on the show, Joseph. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Now, can we call you Joe or? Yeah, yeah, yeah it doesn't. <laughs> Kinda feel anyway, like um, my, my father's name was Boo. Oh, right. Okay. Everybody used to call me Little Boo in my hometown. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if we have to call you Mr. Joe, but, <laughs> no. but there's a million reasons why, uh, why we, we would want you on the show. Going right back to early papers and, uh, you know, my, a, a book that launched me, The Emotional Brain, and so on and so forth going on and on but the real uh trigger at the moment is your new book which is just fantastic and the title of itself is amazing <laughs> a deep history of ourselves subtitle coming the four billion year story of how we got conscious brains yeah it's a good one <laughs> I, I, and it actually it actually made me laugh and be fascinated because this is a, i've always gone back in my toys and, and my son is, is gorgeous when he was a teenager he would say dad i have a question i just want an answer if you start talking about dinosaurs i'm out of here <laughs> but it's been it's relevant it's relevant so perhaps uh, i guess we really should start as here's this person who's well known mostly for working with fear the amygdala uh and those areas and you've gone on this long long story what what drove you to do this enormous piece of of work well it actually relates to australia how about that okay there we go we're all <laughs> <laughs> so i had a um a colleague who was studying you know s slimy little invertebrates uh studying memory in them he was working in the in the lab of eric kandel who's a nobel prize winner for his work on memory yes we know him well and was seth grant from australia Yes, uh, and um, Seth was uh, studying the genetic mechanisms of learning and memory in the Kendall model, the aplysia, uh, which is a sea slug. Um, and the they had discovered all these. Uh, Kendall and his colleagues had discovered all of these uh, molecules involved in in the in allowing the sea slug to learn and store information, often about danger. And those molecules then became um, you know, ideas that, of what we could pursue in the mammalian brain, which is much more complicated. But because they had done it in a simpler nervous system, you know, they figured out what was important. And so we tested a lot of those and they turned out to be important. And I didn't think about that too much and, until I started talking to Seth, really. And I um, said, well, you know, that means there's a, a common ancestor that has given these aplysia and mammals the same genes and molecules, and that what he was studying was the, um, the role of NMDA receptors, which is a, a kind of molecule that's very important in synaptic plasticity, both in the mammalian brain and in the user brain, and in the fly brain, and in, basically in all brains, I guess. Mm, mm, um, yeah. And he had broken it down into, you know, specific kind of molecular components and began to trace those back in evolution. And you know, a key point was that he and I guess other people were studying this too, but they converge on a kind of early bilateral animal uh, that existed, you know, maybe 630 million years ago as being the ancestor of both a mouse and a, an aplysia. I guess the aplysia is over here and the mouse is over here in my... Yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. So... And so there had to be something, and what it seems to be is a, a, a little worm, a bilateral worm that was one of the earliest bilateral animals. Now, before bilateral animals, what do we have? We have jellyfish kinds of things that, are, that don't have a, a front, back, top, bottom, and left and right side. They just have a top and a bottom. Jellyfish are round, right? They have this, that kind of circular organization. So they're a bit more primitive, but they also have a nervous system and they learn and they have these NMDA receptor components or at least some of them. And, you know, before jellyfish thing, like things, you had sponges. They're not very, you know, are sponges animals really? You know, that's kind of an insight, but yes, they are. It's not just a, something you wipe your dishes with. It's a, a real animal. And the, the original sponge dish wiping device <laughs> came from sponges, the animal. Yeah. Uh, but now, we, now they're all synthetic, of course. Uh, the dishwashing thing, not the sponges. <laughs> and, but, and they've got these 
receptor molecules. Mm. Then, but that's not the end. You know, before sponges were single cell protozoa that also have these molecules. And you know, the, there are three kinds of multicellular animals, plants, animals, uh, not, uh, animal, not but animals, multicellular organisms, plants, animals, and fungi. Now, you know, we think of fungi as hanging out with the vegetables in the grocery store, mushrooms and so forth. But the, the mushrooms are actually closer to us evolutionarily uh, than to plants. Wow. Mm-hmm. Kind this, of a mind blowing thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't but they all have these molecules. Yeah. And if you keep going, you find that they're in bacteria as well. Or at least and, some of them. Now, I, I, what's just sort of giving, because of course, as you know, we're a, a psychotherapy based uh, a group. And yeah. The, the importance of it is, and so much of what you're saying, uh, I've done various bits of study in, in, out of my curiosity and the, yeah. the degrees I've done. But when you're sitting there looking at a human being sitting across from you, um, I think it's expansive. And, and I think it's important to get this sense that, uh, and even going right back to Luca, the little name we yeah. give to the, to, the, to the mother of all uh, uh, change in, in, and creation of DNA, that there's there's this there's something in front of you that has a long long developmental history, and right. they didn't just you know bang into space uh, into, right. into time and space. There's stuff in them that they uh, that they're good at dealing with, mm-hmm. um, but they're not dealing with it terribly well in the context of their daily life, and hence they have uh, affective disturbances. Right. And that's what that's I, what I, really I, excites me about the book. Yeah, I want, to, I want to make the, the key connection here, which is that when we think of the amygdala and its ability to control freezing and fleeing and changes in blood pressure and stress hormone release and all the things that it does, what we're looking at is the four billion year story of danger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the first cell that you mentioned, Luca, that ever lived to reproduce itself lived long enough to reproduce itself and to give rise to, you know, other cells that could do that, um, had to be able to detect danger to stay alive. And the way bacteria cells do that is, you know, they, they kind of like are randomly moving through the environment. And if they happen to encounter a nutrient, they keep going towards it and maybe speed up a little bit and get closer and closer and get more and more of it. But if it's a toxin, they flip away, you know, they tumble. Uh, the behavior is actually called tumbling and they just tumble in another direction and start randomly moving somewhere else. So they use this kind of swimming and tumbling behavior to do five things, well, to do four things. One is to detect danger and move away from it. The other is to incorporate nutrients. Another is to balance fluids and ions. So if they're in a concentration where the salt is too high or too low, they either have to move further into it or further out of it to, to adjust that. Um, and they also thermoregulate, for example. Now, uh, and finally, they reproduce. Now, bacteria don't reproduce sexually, so there's no behavior involved in that. They just split in half. But their splitting in half is the basis of later sexual reproduction, where you require two organisms to do it. So all of these things, when we talk about these things, defense against danger, incorporating nutrients, um, balancing fluids and ions, thermoregulating and reproducing, we naturally attribute psychological states onto them mm-hmm. because that's what we have when we do those things. You know, when we're incorporating nutrients, in other words, eating or drinking for balancing fluids, thermoregulating, getting, you know, like a lizard will get on a rock, but we can put on a shirt or take it off and we can do all kinds of things to regulate our temperature and reproducing. So we have all these mental states, fear and pleasure and all these things that go with these behaviors. Um, but the point is that these behaviors have nothing to do with psychology. They mm. exist to keep the organism alive. And that is true in us as well as in many other organisms. And that's why it's so important that we understand this long history. Because once we see that the amygdala is not a fear center that's making this, you know, fear is not bubbling up out of it but instead a defensive circuit that is detecting and responding to danger, it's a whole new perspective. Fear is your awareness that something terrible or dangerous is happening to you. Now, yeah. this is where we come to the, this fundamental misunderstanding where you know, typically you're at a party, people are asking what you do or something about the brain. Oh, the amygdala, 
<laughs> this, and I was, I was joking with um, R- Richard before. There's uh, if anyone in our field, you know, if you if you say, you know, complete this series of words: uh, uh, um, fear, amygdala, Joseph Ledoux <laughs> is the typical <laughs> response here. Your name is highly correlated with it is, it is, fear. Yeah. But and this, I'm partly responsible for this idea. So. Yeah. This this idea that the amygdala, um, in itself, this discrete, um, you know, set of neurons, is the seat of fear, the feeling of fear. Right. Yeah. Um, it, and I know for a long time now you've been trying to debunk this idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, well, after debunking it for a long time, I'm trying to debunk. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> well, I yes. think that's that's what's exciting too, Joseph. Is you, is you you've not sat on it. Uh, I mean, I my um, my amygdala i don't know which parts of me pricked up the 2017 article with uh, richard brown right uh, mm. you know where you you brought in this idea of this higher order uh, theory of of emotional consciousness right uh which you talked about with fear and <laughs> actually my wife and i do a lot of work with pain and we've been talking about that that principle of the pain the the the, yeah. the stimulus state and yeah. then the the emotional state so yeah. can you run yeah. us around some of the thinking yeah. because this is this is what's going to blow well, the therapists away yeah let, so let's uh, let's talk about pain for a second uh, you know physical pain yeah you see a dog that's been hit by a car and it's on the side of the road and it's writhing and you know crying and doing all kinds of things that we project psychology onto but really what you see are reflexes yeah. All those responses are reflexes caused by the tissue damage, and it's just a protective response. It's just trying to cope with, with that kind of situation. Um, now, I'm not saying the dog is not in some kind of psychological pain state as a result of that, um, but that's not what you see. You know, pain yeah. is not yeah. reflecting. It's not the, the circuit that's making the experience of pain is not the one that's generating all those protective behaviors there. So... But, the problem is that um, uh, what did I want to say now? The uh, um, you know pain is um, oh so if if you if you have someone who has chronic pain, um, if you have patients that, that have this try this and tell them a joke, and for you know that instant when they're laughing they're not in pain because pain you have to be attending to something you have to have this in your mind as a high order state in order to actually be feeling the pain. Otherwise, you, you might still have some body activity around the pain. Of course, you probably will. But it's not going to invade your mind and take over your thought processes the way it does when you're just sitting there and have nothing else on your mind. Right. right. So it was but, very interesting. I, I had a client who was working, who came to me with this, this very issue. Uh, he, was, he was fairly well informed or fairly either academically or intuitively. But he said, I have a biological uh, disruption in my spine at the lower area that is going to that gives me a level of stimulus. I know this and it gives me a two or a three in the Likert scale of pain. But when I feel and I know that when I'm feeling my eight and nine, that it's actually in my head. Uh, can you help me get the, the the those five or six points of pain out of my head so that I just can deal with the two or three? Right. <clears throat> and we actually there's mechanisms, and we we manage to do this through yeah, various yeah. things. Exactly, as you say of, of distraction. Mm-hmm. And one of the thoughts I had in that was, is working memory uh, relevant in this in this context of being able to distract and mm-hmm. so on and so forth? What's yeah. the relevance there? Well, yeah, so I did, first let me just say that probably I'm sure there are people that have eight and nine and ten pain, so we, we don't want to like say that uh, it's all in your head all the time. Oh, no, no, that's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Just clear that up then. Um, yeah, so uh, working memory is kind of a place, not a place, but a, a system circuit and process in your brain where you hold information in mind temporarily and you can then have thoughts about it or, you know, you can tend to it, have metacognitions about it, uh, you can introspect about it, um, you can appraise things and monitor your body, and you can, it's where you do all of your kind of cognitive work. Uh, and this idea has been around for, you know, since the 70s, uh, through the work of Alan Babley in the, in the UK. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's generally believed to be the cognitive kind of workspace of the brain. Now, uh, much of that, I, I believe, and not everyone agrees with this, I think, but a lot of that operation operates non-consciously, that it's a, uh, an implicit process that, that is collecting information, gathering it, 
putting it all together. Uh, and at, at the same time, it then becomes available as conscious content. But that's, and that's, that's a, a fascinating thing. It's, and it's this division, uh, or not division, but a, uh, a sense of um, uh, separate processes of these experiences that when you talked about fear, you had that. Matt, you're, you're no. champing at the bit for something. So I'll no, yeah, Jeff, so we're, we're coming to this real sim systems thinking. So, um, you know, we're, we're always on about, uh, you know, we're a complex nonlinear, you know, system. And yeah. so, so making the, the differentiation between um, things that are pattern recognizers that are recognizing patterns in the environment and causing a behavioral response to avoid something working in tandem with, you know, what you, what we're calling these emotional schemas, which are higher right. order prefrontal, um, you know, very, very complex schemas, which are individual. And I think this is an important distinction, uh, which you, you obviously, you know, you are talking about um, to make for therapists, because I think um, it's still ingrained in, um, in, in general, you know, thinking about fear, that it really, that still this discrete pattern recognizer um, is, is, is evoking all of this, you mm -hmm. know, emotion, when in fact, we're talking about a mental schema in higher order cortical thinking, which to my mind gives hope because we can change those schemas. Right. So, uh, yeah, let's just follow the flow of a stimulus through the brain mm -hmm. so we can see what, how all that works out. Mm -hmm. So you've got a snake at your feet and it's picked up by your eyes and that goes into your visual system. And that information can then get to your amygdala, either from what I used to call, sometimes still do call the low road, the yeah. limic inputs to the amygdala before the cortex. But it can also get there from the cortex. Now, a lot of people got confused thinking that the high road was the road from the visual cortex to the prefrontal cortex. And maybe it was a little mis. The terminology was not quite right, but what I meant by the high road was the cortical sensory input to the uh, amygdala that parallel the thalamic input to the amygdala. Right. Yep. So, but a lot of people thought it was because then I said the, that the visual cortex, in addition to sending the high road information to the amygdala, sends it to the prefrontal cortex and to other parts of the, the brain. Mm -hmm. And so when, so that amygdala stuff, is going to get in there and control, trigger, you know, the body responses like freezing. Uh, so when the snake is there, your brain detects it, you freeze before you step on it. That's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and your blood pressure and heart rate are going to perk up and your brain is going to be releasing norepinephrine and all kinds of other chemicals throughout. Um, activity will be aroused throughout the brain, the body. Signals are going to be feeding back. All of that stuff that we think of as emotional, I think of is part of the defensive circuit. Mm -hmm. It's stuff mm -hmm. that is there to kind of get the brain going and deal with all of this. And yeah. it happens regardless of, you know, it happens in flies, it happens in mice, it happens in people. It has nothing to do with the experience. The experience now is that the visual cortex transmission to prefrontal cortex, but it's not simply that because visual system has to go both has to also go to memory systems mm -hmm. so that memories can be activated. So prefrontal cortex can, and pre, those memory systems will project to prefrontal cortex as well. So prefrontal cortex is getting the sensory information from visual cortex, but also uh, semantic memory, episodic memory, autobiographical memory, and then all of that is coming into the prefrontal cortex. And that's where working memory is going to do its job of integrating the perception with all these kinds of memories into uh, a picture of what's there. Now, if it's a dangerous situation, those memories that are activated are gonna be about danger, maybe even about your danger, episodic memories uh, and so on. So that's what we call an emotion schema, or in this case, a fear mm -hmm. schema. All those memories that, about everything that's happened to you in your life about danger. And nobody else has those memories. So your fear schema is distinct to you. It's unique to you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. when that thing is activated, now we don't have a complete and total activation of one's fear scheme. You, that's a lot of memory. Mm. The present situation will produce a kind of relatively selective activation of a subset, what we might call a momentarily active fear schema. Mm. 
that then becomes uh, uh, is, is put together in working memory. And that is a non-conscious representation. That is the platform upon which our conscious experience can arise. And in other words, fear can arise. So um, one way to think about that is that we have, uh, that, that that non-conscious information produces a signal that uh, generates a narrative. Now, the narrative is generated non-consciously because we don't, you know, plan our narratives. They, they are things we just generate. And, uh, but that is then available in consciousness. It is narrated non-consciously. Not yeah. non-conscious narration reaches consciousness awareness. Now, where did I get this crazy idea? Well, it happened in, I don't know, 1976 or so when Mike Kazanaga and I were studying split-brain patients. And we would see uh, these patients day after day do these strange things, like put a stimulus into the right hemisphere and ask the left hemisphere, what did you see? And um, the left hemisphere is, should I review what a split brain patient is just to kind of- Yes, uh, please. Just quickly, because it's yeah. fascinating, so, fascinating stuff, mm. yeah. So a split brain patient is someone who um, has epilepsy and their brain uh, their epilepsy couldn't be controlled in any other means, by any other means, such as medications and everything else that was tried. So um, in some cases, a very radical procedure was done, especially in the 1960s and 70s, which is called split brain surgery, where the connections between the two sides of the brain are severed surgically, so that what's in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere remain isolated. So, you know, what goes in the right hemisphere stays in the right hemisphere, kind of like the old story about Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the right hemisphere has this information, um, and let's say you make the right hemisphere perform some behavior. Now, the left hemisphere is the guy you're talking to. Uh, right. as it so the, the left hemisphere can tell you, well, you know, uh, when, the, when the left hemisphere sees a stimulus, so I saw an apple. When the right hemisphere sees an, an apple, you say, what did you see? The left hemisphere says, I didn't see anything. Now the left hand connected to the right hemisphere can reach in a bag and pull the apple out of, and leave the banana and uh, the other thing in there. Um, um, but it can't tell you what's there. So, uh, but it, that shows that it has some recognition of, of what you've presented to it because it can find it now, but it's a nonverbal uh, response. So, um, you know, I was talking to Mike the other day about this and, you know, he said, yeah, well, um, I said, well, are you sure that, that our studies were the ones that discovered this thing that I'm about to tell you about? Because I was reading in your older book, uh, The Bisected Brain, that um, your patient NG back in the 60s um, also was generating behaviors through the right hemisphere and kind of generating a narrative. He said, yeah, but we didn't, we didn't put it all together. You know, we talked right. about it, we wrote about it, but we didn't have uh, the concept. So he said, you know, for 20 years or so, we were asking, what did you see? And then all of a sudden in the studies Mike and I did, we said, you know, uh, why did you do that instead? Right. So yeah. we, the right hemisphere, we would put stimuli into the right hemisphere and, you know, do things like make the guy stand up or do some kind of behavior. And so we would then say, why did you do that? And the left hemisphere would say, oh, I needed to stretch kind of like. Or if you if you know you made the right hemisphere laugh in some way, you would then say, "Why'd you do that?" And he'd say, "Oh, you guys are really funny." And so there were these narratives that were being generated to explain these unconscious behaviors from the point of view of the left hemisphere. Behavior produced by the right hemisphere is coming from a non-conscious system. So we thought, well, what kinds of systems in daily life are producing non-conscious behaviors? Well, maybe emotion systems. Mm. And so. That, you know, we were at the bar drinking Jack Daniels that night after the work. And so the light bulb went off in my head. So that's what I want to study, emotion. Mm -hmm. And so there were no good techniques to do that in the 1970s, no functional imaging and so forth. So I said, well, I'm going to do that in rats. And so I went on and began studying rats. And that led me to the amygdala, uh, which I always thought of as a non-conscious processor of danger. Now, I called it an implicit fear center to contrast mm, right. with cortical systems that I thought were involved in the explicit fear. Right. Fear. Uh, and I borrowed that distinction from the memory literature, which is, had, it become, had it become popular in memory at that time to talk about implicit memory 
versus explicit memory. Implicit memory is unconscious, explicit conscious. So I said, okay, unconscious fear, that'll be implicit fear in the amygdala, conscious fear in the cortex. And the amygdala becomes a fear center, yeah. and loves it, and forget the implicit, that's too boring. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like, ta-da, yeah, yeah. Ta -da, yeah. Now, you know, so it's interesting um, to reflect back, even before this, there was another problem, I think, that's equally important, which has to do with um, reward and pleasure. So in, in 1956, Jim Olds published a paper in, Sci uh, in Science, a magazine called Science, called Pleasure Centers of the Brain. Now, this was a, a kind of review uh, paper for a general audience about the work that he and Peter Milner had done discovering self-stimulation in the brain. So you put an electrode in a certain part of the brain, it was discovered accidentally by them. The rat will then press the bar nonstop to get that jolt of, of electricity in that part of the brain. And so they were interested in, this was like the heyday, well, it was the end of the heyday of behaviorism um, in the early 50s. So they were interested in reinforcement mechanisms. Um, but the article was called Pleasure Centers of the Brain. So, you know, I read the article very carefully and not once does the word pleasure appear in the article. It's wow. only, in the, I think it was an editorial decision. It's marketing, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Editors of science probably said, Jim, this is like, this is pleasure, man. <laughs> okay, let's do that. So. The, the, um, pleasure, the reinforcement centers became pleasure centers. Um, re, um, reinforcement became reward. Reward became pleasure. Roy Wise, another neuroscientist, uh, then said, well, dopamine's involved in reinforcement and therefore in reward. And so maybe dopamine is the chemical of pleasure. Now, both Wise and um, um, Oles recanted their pleasure. Uh, yes. Mm. Flirt, flirtations there um, later, but by then the cat was out of the bag, you know, and, and that we're still struggling with those terms, um, the, the yeah. role of dopamine and pleasure and the role of uh, pleasure in, in addiction and, and all of this. Mm. And this is, this is one of the struggles too uh, that, that we talk about, and some people rather uh, aggressively in, in the, the psychology and psychotherapy area talk about uh, neurobabble that uh -huh. there's there's a whole bunch of stuff it doesn't help yeah. us and there's there's some uh, studies say it does totally and it doesn't it's totally but, true but it's totally true yeah. but what it is is, is uh, to, to me uh, I, I work a lot with curiosity um as a framework of uh, mm. of motivation so so constantly using things as springboards rather than what we tend to do with science is we figure something out and then try and implement and uh, try and you know uh, stick it into a a, a hole and and make it stay yeah. but it should always be fluid which is what you're doing because you've taken the word fear kind of out of the amygdala now this is this is your current to. point <laughs> yeah 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 a tough job yeah so yeah, what, don't listen to me as <laughs> <laughs> so um but, you know we can also generalize this to education because the um there's a lot of like neuro education stuff mm -hmm. and you know, I have a, a friend named John Brewer who um, wrote a book about this, and I forget when, maybe in the 90s or so. And he said, really, you know, that all this neuro stuff is really, the, you know, it's not far enough along to really help education. What's important is like the psychology. Is, are the, is, the, is the approach working behaviorally? Not, you know, what part of the brain lights up when you, uh, you, you know, do that approach. And I think that's kind of where we are. It's, um, th there's not a lot of information that I think can revolutionize education at this point uh, about critical periods and, and all of that, because critical periods are best understood in terms of the visual cortex, but that's not where we do our learning. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm. yeah, I, and you know, it's, I'm, I'm sure there are things that have been useful uh, in, the, in the neuroeducation field. But just because some things are useful doesn't mean that everything that is said is useful. And I think that's the problem. Yeah, right. it's, a bit, it's a bit bananas nowadays. Uh, there's, there's another, the thing that causes the thing. Uh, and yeah. again, this, this is going back to what Matt was saying. We, you know, we've been trying to argue that um, we, we must think 
in a more must think in a more complex system way system. and in my last book I, mm. I my second chapter was first of all learn to think in systems and uh -huh. and everybody has sort of said I, I got halfway through that chapter and my brain exploded and I closed <laughs> the book so you know I, I think as we know, our left hemisphere is very good at breaking things down into discrete entities and, um, you know, that very mechanistic left brain way of uh, analyzing something. And I think that plays right into, you know, looking at discrete brain regions that are responsible for such and such a thing, um, rather than, you know, engaging more of our right hemisphere to have this more holistic, you know, mm -hmm. com complex systems. Um, I would prefer to think of it in terms of not a left hemisphere and right hemisphere, but Mm -hmm. you know specific kinds of processes because right the hemispheres don't do anything you know brain areas don't really do anything it's all about you know tiny little circuits and we, you know we can't really get at the details of that in the human brain but that we can in animals so some people think well you know I, I, one of my points in all this is that we don't really know what another animal is experiencing mm -hmm. that doesn't mean they're not experiencing anything but scientifically is it you know really a question we can address uh, with experiments. And I think that's been very difficult and it's really mostly based on intuition and opinion uh, about what's on another um, animal's mind. So mm -hmm. I think we have to, uh, you know, just dial that uh, back a little bit. And mm -hmm. uh, the point though is that there's so much we can learn without having to assume that kind of um, uh, uh, stuff about other animals in terms of experience because we have for example non-human primates and humans have very very similar cognitive processes i mean we have a lot of you know additions and uh, accentuations of it but uh, we can learn a tremendous amount of and we have learned a tremendous about working memory and other cognitive processes through studying non-human primates um, and that helps us understand at a, a coarser level in the human brain what we can what, what is going on there because and that has also been true in studying the amygdala we know a lot through the kinds of studies i've done about the details but my colleague liz phelps did the human version of it uh, showing that at least a first approximation the human amygdala and the animal amygdala respond very similarly to danger and so that's what I meant about the, the hemispheres and, and even brain areas that we, we can't say much about what a brain area does, even though we, all, we often do that. And I'm guilty of it myself um, because it's really about the details. Now we can learn a lot about those details from animals, but we are not at a place where we can do that in the human brain just because we don't have the tools and techniques. So we just have to be a little cautious when we talk about areas and things like that. So we have, we do have these rational, logical processes, um, but it's not. I wouldn't call it both what the whole left hemisphere does and the the more spatial stuff. I wouldn't say that that's totally what the right hemisphere does because there's spatial on both sides. There's language on both sides. We know that now, and so mm -hmm. things are a lot more similar than they are different. I would say in the two hemispheres. Yeah. 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 You get these these specific activities. I mean, when you're which is trying to find the causal frames. Uh, yeah. And I, because there are a number of things in the more systemic uh, way of looking at things, this idea of just kind of how does it organize itself? Uh, and certainly that these uh, area activities are emergent, emergent qualities perhaps, yeah. but already you've gone through with this idea of, you know, moving towards nutrients, moving away from poisons. Yeah. And one thing I loved in the beginning of uh, one of the early chapters, I think chapter five of the book or area five or something in, in, in the book, but it just said this very, very simple thing about uh, the development of complex organisms. Uh, and uh, I think I wrote it down somewhere yeah, that, that a successful organism or operates as a unit with a high degree of cooperation and a low degree of conflict. And that these, I, this, this concept of conflict and cooperation uh, seem to be just universal mechanisms of um, uh, of what we have this felt sense. Yeah. So somebody feels sick when there's conflict going on. So we have yeah. we have conscious uh, perceptions of this conflict. Of course, it's not yeah. specifically the conflict, and we don't yeah. have a specific concept of of the amygdala's firing or the so and so's firing. Um, 
But these, what, what in psychotherapy and psychology we call the felt sense, um, is is enough uh, to tell you that there's a conflict somewhere. Right. Um, what what uh, is there any thoughts you can add and expand yeah, on so that? Sort of I'm glad you brought that up because the, um, the you know the whole first half of the book, I didn't know any of that stuff. I had to, I really, I really, I had to learn it uh, because it, I just, I got to the beginning of life and said, well, now I got to figure out how to get back up, the, climb up the tree of life. And um, so it was a long, complicated thing because um, I, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. So really the first half of the book is written more as a science journalist. Uh, yeah, it's a every, lovely, fresh look. That's what I like about it. Well, thank you. Um, it's just the stuff that I needed, you know, to kind of build the story from the beginning uh, to make it all make sense. Um, but one thing I, one thought I had in terms, you said, you know, people's minds are exploding when you, when they're reading chapter three of your book or something. Yeah. What I, I had that complaint about my last book as well, anxious. And, and so this, in this book, the chapters are like 1500, 2000 words max. As yeah. You, and, um, people have told me that they find it very useful because, you know, it's a very, it's like three pages of text. Um, and so you can read three pages, digest it, either go on to the next or put it down to the next day or whatever. Can I take this opportunity to um, just segue into when we're talking about intervention, we're talking about fear and anxiety. And, you know, we've, we've talked about narrative, schemas, perceptions, um, as opposed to, you know, discrete neural um, circuits that are just res responding. Okay. And so thinking about that, and then thinking about drug intervention, which can often be a very blunt instrument, what are your thoughts about intervention, be they mm -hmm. drug intervention or, you know, other psychological, you know, methods? Okay. Um, I just realized I didn't complete the thought about the uh, uh, conflict. Oh, so cool. Yeah, fin finish that one. Second, and sure. I'll come right back to it. So the conflict thing turns out to be about a cell. Yeah. You know, the, the if the parts of the cell are in conflict, then uh, it will not work properly. And so when prokaryotic cells, which didn't have a nucleus, uh, gave way to euka eukaryotic cells, which had a nucleus, uh, that occurred by way of the invasion of a bacterial cell into another kind of prokaryotic cell called an archaeal cell. And so now you have two genomes inside one cell. And in order for that, those two genomes to work together, they had to, sp shed, they had to shed a lot of genes that were in conflict. Yes. And the genes that remained allowed the, most of the DNA to be in, um, in the nucleus of the cell and most of the um, uh, other stuff, the other DNA that was present, ended up, the bacterial cell became a mitochondria. And so that's the mitochondrial DNA, is the DNA left over from bacterial cells that went into this other kind of prokaryotic. I know that's complicated. But, uh, well, I think, I think that's... people recognize those names, but, 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 this is, but even still, despite the, the, specifics, the specifics of that, just that, that idea that the organizing principle um, enabled this type of shift and change, uh, which you know we generally call evolutionary change, right. uh, that um, that keeps following that principle and keeps expressing itself. Uh, and I think it's it's probably the simplest fundamental of understanding. Someone comes in because I, I often say, I'm sorry, we'll get back to yours, Matt. Maybe this will segue into because mm -hmm. uh, I, I in, the, in the beginning of my book I I introduce it saying people come into our office and say uh, I'm not okay. Right. And okay. then you do stuff, uh, varying depending on, on your environment. And then someone says, oh, I'm okay now. And they, they stop therapy. Right. Right. And the fascinating question to me is, how do they know? Right. And so, this conflict I, I, cooperation I, 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 thing is a yeah. beautiful thing. Okay. So disclaimer, I am not a therapist and I don't know much about it at all. Um, well, we are, we disclaim it too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll say what I, uh, what's on my mind about it. So um, we've got these two 
we have many systems in our brain, but we've been talking about two. One that involves the amygdala and another involving cortical cognitive circuits. They receive the threat in parallel uh, and do different things with it. Now, um, if you are developing a medication to solve the problem of fear and anxiety, as the drug companies have been doing since the 1960s when they kind of accidentally came across stuff that seemed to work. Um, and um, so how do you go about doing that? Well, you take something that, that is working, like a benzodiazepine, um, and you um, find tests, behavioral tests, that are sensitive to benzodiazepines. And so that means that that those tests are now viewed as anxiety tests. So now you try to throw other drugs onto that behavior and you don't find anything else that works except benzodiazepines. But you're asking the question from a benzodiazepine point of view because that's how the test was selected yeah. in the first place. Right. So, but more to the point, the when you uh, use these tests, what you're doing is you're putting rats and mice through challenging situations, uh, various kinds of behavioral tasks in which their um, you know, well-being is, is put to test, uh, maybe because there's some shock or they're out in an open space uh, that's unprotected and they could be swept down upon by a hawk or something. Um, and so um, you then observe what happens. So the animals show a certain degree of uh, what we call behavioral inhibition, as Jeffrey Gray used to call it, or timidity, to put it in lay terms. Um, the animals are timid out there. They freeze and they're, you know, it's, it's a disconcerting thing to be in an open space for them. Uh, it's distressing uh, in the biological sense of the word. So um, when they get a medication and they spend, well, for, first of all, they'll run to the, the enclosed area when, when they're like this. They might freeze for a bit, but then they run to the closed area. If you, take, if you find a medication that makes them stay out in the danger longer, maybe that's not such a good idea, but that's the good idea. <laughs> <laughs> then then um, the, uh, that is viewed as an anti-anxiety drug because why else would the animal stay out longer if, unless it was less anxious or less fearful yeah. about the danger? And so then you give the medication to people and it, you know, it doesn't work. The, the, for example, CRF receptor antagonists were, work perfectly in changing animal behavior, but not in changing, making people uh, um, less fearful or anxious. But I think in general, it's been a kind of um, uh, a bit of a, a, a disappointment. The drug companies have concluded that as well, that the drugs are simply new medications are not coming along. And so the chairman of Glasgow Smith Klein, CEO of Glasgow Smith Klein and other companies said, you know, we got to pull out of this because it's just not, uh, we're gonna, at least we're going to reduce our investments because there's, there's nothing good happening um, and it, people aren't getting better. So mm -hmm. I think this is kind of a general crisis in, in the whole psychiatric pharmaceutical treatment area, but we can use fear and anxiety as, as a kind of test case here. Um, and so the question is, why not? Well, let's look at what they actually did. They measured a behavior let's say that depends on circuits involving things like the amygdala, which you know we've known about for a long time. The, the rats freeze, okay, that's the amygdala. Um, so the rats freeze less, they're less fearful. That's the amygdala fear theory. Therefore, if they freeze less, they must be less fearful. And so the medication when given to a human should make the person less fearful. But instead, you don't necessarily uh, find that. Hmm. Uh, example, I, you know, I'm not sure that this is totally correct, but I'm going to give you an example that I use. You can uh, clarify what you think of it. Um, for example, a person on SSRIs uh, with social anxiety uh, might um, find it easier to go to the party. In other words, they might be less timid, less behaviorally avoidant, and might be less physiological aroused. But once they get to the party, they're still you know, anxious about being there. And so the question is, um, why is that? Well, because the person is doing exactly what the rats and mice did in the experiment. They right. hate to change it, but not their experience. And so if, and this totally makes sense, if in fact the subcortical circuits controlling these behaviors uh, are doing one thing, but 
the, the experience that the person is having is being generated by the cortical cognitive circuits, um, then it makes sense that the behavioral changes shouldn't translate, and, and behavioral changes in mice shouldn't translate into therapeutic yeah. success in people. Now, yeah. you, you gave the example, the person walks in, they don't feel so hot, they walk out, they feel better. But I think in general, the, um, the, since the beginning of modern psychotherapy, first when you had behavioral therapy, that was coming out of behaviorism. Mm -hmm. And even then once that morphed into cognitive behavioral therapy, the emphasis was still on behavioral metrics rather than yeah. on the experience. Yeah. Um, and certainly the pharmaceutical industry, which also came out of behaviorism in terms of the methods and the people doing it in the 60s were all trained by the behaviors. Again, it's all about changing behavior, not about experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, we wrote an article, um, Danny Pine, a psychiatrist, and I wrote an article in the American Journal of Psychiatry that talked about this kind of marginalization of subjective experience and how that needs to be reevaluated um, because ultimately if the person doesn't feel better, the therapy is not a success. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, uh, I, I often talk uh, uh, in shorthand of just saying that so much of this stuff, the, the tail's wagging the dog and right. um, it's all very well and good that, that, that it looks like the dog's uh, happy, but, <laughs> but, it, but it's not it. And with uh, Ernie, Ernie Rossi, Ernest Rossi is a, a, a Ericksonian therapist and my mentor and uh, has been mm -hmm. around in the psychotherapy and psychological area for a long time. And he's incorporated a lot of the ideas coming in from uh, complexity theory and neuroscience. And he's done a lot of work with genetics and things. But we, we talk about the capacity of the observer operator um, and that um, that some of the certainly the medications and to some degree uh, a lot of therapeutic processes where the the therapist is taking the is being the drug is being the the mm. when the the tail uh, wagging uh, removes that uh, it's the operator we can observe but we lose this this reframing and restructuring and reorganizing of, mm. of the actual physical operations and as you which you just simply put in the simple term of of the experience the experience right. within uh and and how that regulates and registers within the individual it's quite interesting i think you you saw the um that i've been posting these things on psychology today and yeah the kind of excerpts from the book uh, to try and get at the one that I just posted that, that has been the most successful in terms of 24 hour uh, hits in terms of uh, views. I, I was really surprised at that, but okay. it's called um, an emotion is. Yeah, that's right. But that, but that's right. And an emotion is, uh, I mean, we go back to Damasio and the, you know, the, the feeling of what happens and what's a feeling and what's an emotion we're, and we're, we're here we are. That was what was that the nineties. We're still, yeah. we're still trying to get a grip of it. And I think it's, as you say, we get these big breakthroughs and then we stick with them uh, yeah. uh, rather than bounce off them. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've kind of moved away from the emotion feeling uh, distinction to, I find that, it's, um, you know, this, this is more of a, a strategic decision rather than necessarily a, uh, something that, you know, that's been driven by research or anything. But I think that we, we have a tendency to um, confuse things that are talked about, that where the words are kind of similar, they get sliced together, like implicit and explicit fear drop the implicit feelings and emotions people think well what's that what's that distinction again which one is the body and which one is the so you know i kind of say okay i'm not going to do that i did well for a while i talked about it in the way antonio did but i decided it was just too confusing and so um i think that rather the idea is to move emotions or let, let me put it a different way use mental state terms for mental states yeah and not for behaviors and that's mm. why the Antonio's idea that emotions are behaviors, you know, that the emotion systems are controlling the behavior stuff is confusing. Yeah. It's a mental, it's kind of a mental state term. You know, you could argue about that in terms of the Greek origins of uh, emotion was to move and so forth. So maybe it was originally about behavior, but it becomes a big issue in terms of when our folk psychology, 
is relevant scientifically and when it isn't. Um, and a fellow named Garth Fletcher um, had a paper, I think it was in uh, Annual Review of Psychology, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's where it was, a long time ago, uh, that said, okay, there are two uses, there are two ways to think about folk psychology, one that's useful and one that's not scientifically. So scientifically, folk psychology, you know, all these words about our mental states are not useful for describing most of the behaviors that we study in psychology. But they are useful for, for, discuss, for talking about our mental states. And so the, the, that's what folk psychology is. I mean, all these words about our, our experiences, fear and love and you know, anger and passion and all of these things we talk about um, are uh, from folk psychology. And that's where our mental life is. It's, that's, mm. our, that's where we live it. So there's nothing wrong with talking about experience in terms of folk psychology. Is there any sort of last comments that you want to uh, just yeah, wind up the, the direction um, for us? In the, you know, I think my favorite part of the book is the epilogue, um, it, which is kind of like, you know, a tag on thing. I ended, I have put a prologue and an epilogue on this book. This, if you only read those two parts, you kind of get a sense of what's going on. But in the epilogue, you know, what I, you know, the whole book is building up to how we got these kinds of autonoetically or self-conscious uh, brains. And um, so in the epilogue, I say, well, this is great. The, you know, our autonoetically self-conscious brains are responsible for our greatest achievements as a species, but also for our worst proclivities. And, you know, our greed, our selfishness, hate, avarice, uh, just all this awful stuff, and especially a lot of what's going on politically now in the world, mm. uh, reflects both, you know, the good side well, the political stuff, I think, often reflects the bad side of our autonomic consciousness. Yes. But there is a tremendous good side, our art, our literature, music, uh, science, um, education, medicine, all of these wonderful things that, that we've created as a species. Now, the philosopher Ted May said, well, we've created all these wonderful things. Would it be a tragedy if we, as it looks like we're doing, are heading for self-destruction as a species and destroying the environment and uh, this destroying ourselves and who knows where we're going to be even in a hundred years from now. Uh, he said, would it be a tragedy if we were no longer in charge of the world or even around on the world to, uh, to see what's going on? He concluded that it would be a, a tragedy because of our great achievements. But, you know, I think that that's kind of a, a, a side issue to the fact that we are plunging ourselves into the abyss at this point. And, um, you know, a lot of people worry about, are we destroying the planet? And I think that that's uh, not the case. Um, the, the planet has survived, you know, massive geophysical upheavals in the past and will just continue just fine. Uh, it may, but it's not going to continue with the current configuration of biological life. And each species that we lose changes the effects has effects on all those that remain. So as we begin to, you know, to ignore all these species that are dying at an accelerating rate right now, we're changing our ability to cope uh, and live in the future as well. The Amazon fires are, you know, changing the, the entire structure of, of what we have to live with. So it, it's not clear we're gonna really make it, but uh, if, if we don't, you know, we can, be assured that the bacteria, which have been around for 4 billion years, are going to make it. And they'll just start over. And it's very unlikely that it will ever kind of continue in the same direction that led to us. I mean, that was just such a gazillion little random things that happened to make the first cell work out. And then all of the things that allowed bacterial cells to divide and separate into archaeal cells and archaeal cells and bacterial cells to come back together to create eukaryotic cells. And then we had plants and animals and fungi and the rest of life. Um, the, I guess the last point is that, you know, the, we learned, you mentioned the dinosaurs earlier, but one thing we learned from the dinosaurs is that large energy demanding organisms don't survive well when the conditions around them change drastically. They require too much. So that's how tiny little mammals um, that were alive then were not affected by the mass extinctions because they didn't need very much to get along. And then, you know, they kind of reproduced and spread and 
dispersed and changed. And all of a sudden, you've got the whole new mammal-dominated dom world. Mm. Uh, so what happens is that the biological power shifts when you have drastic changes. And it's not going to go in the direction of large energy-demanding demand, energy demanding organisms, namely us. Yeah. Mm. And that fundamental that the biochemical uh, units will find a cooperative framework and uh, move away from conflicting um, uh, structures yeah. and uh, the 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 uh, organizing principle will continue um, mm. uh, and we may be we may be the uh, the baby out with the bathwater I'm not quite sure <laughs> yeah so one uh, closing thought that yes. you know consciousness is our best friend and our worst enemy but it's our only hope for pulling this off if we can collectively come together as a world to solve these problems we can do it but our conscious minds have to decide to do that. And I'm not optimistic, but it is our only hope. And we have the, this, uh, look up these wonderful words when you go, the noetic, autonoetic, the anoetic. These things are just so uh, fundamental uh, for everybody. And we, we always encourage with our podcasts, listen to the podcast, then get in there and look everything up because there's, uh, a million springboards that have occurred in the last hour and uh, I, I'm going to be busy for ages except I've got to actually write another book but anyway for now yep. for now uh, yep. we'll just say yep. uh, bye bye Joe wow don't want to let you yep. go but Boy. thanks so much okay thank, thank you, you. thank you so much for being on this podcast all the best thanks okay. been fun bye bye